Hello, this is Bill Curtis, Executive Director of the Consortium for Information and Software Quality, uh, presenting a seminar today on the cost of secure software development. And uh, we have, I want to tell you a little bit about CISC first. We were founded originally by the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon University and the Object Management Group and chartered to create automatable measures for measuring software productivity and quality. Uh, over the last decade, we've produced eight standards that are now available. They're free from uh, our website or OMG's website. Uh, one of them has now been adopted as an ISO standard, the uh, automated function point standard. We have others that have been submitted to ISO, in particular our standard for automated uh, source code measurement of uh, various software qualities, security, reliability, performance efficiency, and maintainability. So oh, we continue on this work. Uh, we continue to uh, work on developing standards for automating software measurement. We're working on one for uh, the software bill of materials. Uh, another project we're launching will be looking at measures for productivity and efficiency in an agile DevOps environment. Uh, we have one coming up for data protection, which will be a subset of our security measures. So we're engaged in continuing to try to help the field uh, quantify itself with standards that can be adopted by vendors that are providing tools for uh, doing these kinds of measurements. You can see our sponsors there on the screen. Uh, those are the organizations that sponsor the work that CISC does. Uh, in particular, one of the sponsors you see there is the Center for Systems and Software Engineering at the University of Southern California, uh, which is led by Dr. Barry Beam. Uh, many of you know Dr. Beam as one of the founders of the field of software engineering. In fact, he was there at the original uh, conference at Garmisch in Germany in 1968 when they coined the term software engineering and, and founded the field. Uh, since then, Barry has been a leader in software engineering practice and research. Uh, probably his best known work is the Kokomo cost estimation models, but there's a lot of other studies and, and important uh, developments that he's been involved in uh, over the last 40 to 50 years. Uh, so today he and his graduate student, Elaine Vincent, are going to produce, are going to talk about their latest work on estimating the effort and cost required to insert security into software development. This is very timely, uh, given that the Department of Defense in the U.S. is going to require all of its 300,000 uh, uh, suppliers and contractors to engage with the uh, cybersecurity maturity model certification and become certified under that model. Uh, and one of the big questions uh, involved in that work is what is it going to cost for all these companies to become compliant with the security requirements in that, uh, in that certification. Uh, this seminar today is going to answer some of that. It's part of our fall series of seminars. Uh, in particular, I want to point out our Cyber Resilience Summit, which will have a lot of speakers from both government and industry on a lot of these topics uh, on October 13th. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about the cost of adding security into software. So I want to turn the session now over to Dr. Beam and soon to be Dr. Vinson. Barry? Okay, thanks Bill. So um, as Bill mentioned, I, I'm the director of the USC Center for Systems and Software Engineering and also the chief scientist of the DOD System Engineering uh, Research Center uh, and uh, as part of that research center, we have a three-year project to uh, uh, try to do the best we can at, at quantifying all of the qualities that people uh, get involved in in, in both systems and, and software. So, uh, so Elaine has been on this project for a couple of years and uh, is a uh, uh, making a good deal of progress on coming up with a uh, a model um, and one of the things that uh, we will be uh, uh, looking for is is more and more data to calibrate the model so as uh, as we go along if you have anything we would be love to follow follow up with you on that so 
at this point, I think I'll turn it over to Elaine. You ready, Elaine? Yes, thank you, Dr. Bim. Um, okay, so let's start. Um, we all know that cybersecurity is a great issue nowadays, and software security is one aspect of it. So uh, many security problems are rooted in the way we develop software. This chart, for example, showed that uh, many of the problems we find in, the, in a study from the U.S. National Vulnerabilities uh, some uh, most of the fre most frequent errors are um, implementation errors like buffer uh, overflow, cross-site scripting, SQL injections, and so on. And if we get only buffer errors, for example, that is showing in the the first the most frequent in this chart, ninety three percent of these errors involved only a single condition typically a failure to check array bounds. So this shows that we have much to do in uh, software development uh, to help um, secure the softwares. Uh, this, this is the CYBOC, the cybersecurity body of the knowledge. I'm bringing this uh, today only to show how complex is the cybersecurity. It involves a lot of uh, different areas and knowledge. Um, but when we talk about software security, we are mostly focusing in these two areas, which is the software security and software, uh, secure software lifecycle. Um, software security is uh, about the categories of programming errors and um, resulting, resulting in bugs. And the techniques we can use to prevent and avoid uh, this kind of errors that um, lead to vulnerabilities. And software life cycle uh, is the application of um, secure software engineering techniques in the whole life cycle. So the resulting software uh, is going to be uh, secure, beautiful, and easier to protect in the, in, in the environment. So this is the uh, touch points, uh, is one example of a secure uh, software development life cycle. And we can see that inc it includes practices to prevent and detect vulnerabilities all over uh, the development process. So for example, uh, when we talk about requirements, we can see um, we can develop abuse case, uh, abuser stories, um, security requirements during architecture and design, we can do risk analysis, uh, risk-based security tests, code reviews, uh, code inspection, or use tools to do uh, static analysis tools, for example, to review the code. Mm -hmm. uh, during tests and results, uh, we can do penetration testing. And of course, during operation, there has to be a feedback uh, from the field to uh, um, improve the process and um, implement the lessons learning lessons learned. So uh, what we are going to discuss today uh, first is um, what uh, how can we see the secure software development as a cost effective uh, the cost eff effectiveness of these uh, practices in software development. Also, then we are going to discuss about the sources of uh, cost in secure software development. And we have two main components, the security practices and the security controls or security features. Uh, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about the survey we did in uh, with practitioners uh, about how they apply these practices. And then um, I'm going to talk also about the existing models we have for cost and secure software development. And we'll see that we have some issues that we have to improve in these models so that we can apply them uh, more successfully. Uh, and then the next steps we're doing in this research. So um, we can see software security as a trade-off. There are advantages and disadvantages in doing more or less security. So if you do more security, 
we have we're going to have more costs on um, on personal expertise on installing and uh, using tools uh, training uh, everyone improving process as we uh, receive feedback from the operation area um, and also the investment is uh, done in early phases of software development but as benefits we can prevent and detect vulnerabilities before uh, the software goes to operation and we avoid many risks this way on the other on the other hand if, if we do a little uh, less security um, we have uh, we can have higher costs uh, in fixing the software after it is delivered, uh, patching these vulnerabilities. We may have downtime if the software is attacked, and then we'll have recovery costs and um, reputation loss, for example. But there are some benefits because we can uh, give more priority to features and we can have a better time to market. So uh, we need to balance uh, this uh, both aspects depending on the risks and the software we are developing. Uh, this, uh, so we, but we don't, so we, we need to achieve this balance. We don't want to overdo security. So in this chart, we have um, um, the security production, which would be a, which will have the inputs, the causes, output, the benefits. It is decomposed using the security level. So if you see here, the dashed lines are the benefits, how the benefits uh, grow according to the security level. And in the solid lines, we have how the costs grow, grows according to the security level. So we can see that at some point, the cost of doing security will be higher than the cost of recovering from an attack, for example. But to to do this kind of analysis, uh, we need to have information about costs and about benefits and which security level we need uh, in the software. And unfortunately, uh, we don't have much of this information to support uh, the decision makers in software development. So uh, we started by um, trying to find out which are these costs and how we can measure uh, these costs. And we did a really um, extensive um, so, uh, literature review and trying to find as many information as, as we could about these sources of costs. Um, and we found that, uh, so we searched uh, in this material uh, all related material to software security that discuss the cost, effort, and budget. This table shows um, how we classify, a summary of how we classify the sources of cost. So we can see that most uh, cited um, source was perform security review, then apply threat modeling, perform security testing, apply security requirements, apply security tooling. So all these um, cells in this table, which are uh, orange, they are related to security practice, these activities that we do during the software development. And the gray um, cells are other sources of, of vulnerability, like implement countermeasures can be, it's a general aspect, can be implementing a security feature or um, applying a practice, a, pra a practice as well. Uh, fixed vulnerabilities, um, which also um, is not a practice per se, but it's a cost when we need to fix these vulnerabilities, and so on. So we have we classify this, and we realize that uh, most of these sources that we found, which is, are these orange ones, are really related to software practice. So. We need to um, look into um, this aspect. And when we see, uh, when we look how software, what we have in software, uh, secure software development, um, we can represent this cost um, breaking down from the goals, uh, which, which are to build in security 
to preserve the assets and guarantee confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So these are the goals. But how can we achieve these goals? So there are two aspects in the requirements. We see that are functional aspects in security, when we um, define and select features, controls, or components that will be developed to protect the software. Uh, for example, authentication, authorization, audit, cryptography. So all these components that are going to be developed. And these components we can measure then in lines of code or in function points, any size measure um, that we can use to uh, measure the, the software. On the other hand, we also have a non-functional aspect of uh, security. So uh, in this in this part, we include these this security practices that I was mentioned before, like threat modeling, pen testing. Um, so any constraints that we are going to apply over the features, we can um, classify and this um, as a non-functional or quality um, that we want the software to have. And how can these are really challenge to, challenging to a measure? So we propose to um, develop a scale where we can, um, uh, when we where we can uh, define levels of application for these practices, considering the scope and the rigor that we are applying these practices. So a second step in um, analyzing all these costs is, and these practices was uh, to understand how these were uh, applied in the industry. And then we did a survey with participants of the software security group on LinkedIn, uh, and we obtained 110 responses uh, from 29 different countries but most of uh, the people at uh, around 30% were from the US, then 15% uh, from India, and then we have uh, countries of Europe and uh, other continents as well. And uh, in this, uh, in our sample, we have 30% of security experts, 16% of in a management position, 16% uh, software developers, 12% project leaders in development, 5% members of the security group, 1% testers, security testers, and 13% other, others. So when we found, for example, that apply secure coding standards was one of the most frequent practice for these people, and um, more than uh, 15, 50% apply this practice daily. Uh, then we have also applied security tooling, uh, static analysis tools or dynamic analysis tools, track vulnerabilities, which uh, is to, tra to detect, um, track the vulnerabilities, detect and prioritize their solution apply security requirements, so uh, specify, analyze these requirements, perform security testing, then improve software development, which is to apply the lessons learned from the operations and try to avoid that these problems happen again. Docu document technical stack uh, also used. Um, so we need to um, document which components uh, we have in the product and um, uh, to track uh, uh, if we need to do patch and so on. Perform security review, apply threat modeling, apply data classification scheme to document the sensitive data, um, perform penetration testing, publish operations guide uh, because many problems occur because the configuration of the software is not correct in the operations environment and perform security training. Okay, so now let's do a poll to see um, how the audience, uh, if you apply the security practices. I think it's- Great. Yeah. And this is uh, Tracy with Fisk. I'm gonna help out with the polling and, and Q&A. 
um, since there's quite a few options to choose from, we're going to shoot this out as a couple polls, but let me open the first. Um, so which security practices does your organization apply during development? Here's the first set of responses. We'll leave this open um, to collect. And we'll share once we get through the remainder. Great poll in progress. Let's give it another another ten seconds. Okay, now on to the next. And then we'll show all these. So the next batch, um, which security practices does your organization apply during development? Ten more seconds, and then we'll go to the final. My ten seconds are faster than others. <laughs> uh, okay, so the third part. There's three remaining security practices. Security training, data classification scheme, and publish operations guide. Okay, looks like we got all the votes in. So now, Elaine, would you like to take a look at the results? Yeah, can you can you display the results, Tracy? I can. So here from um, the first page. Okay. Yeah, we have security requirements and security testing. Seventy-eight percent. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, it's interesting because security requirements uh, in in many cases people don't do this formally, but yeah, this is a very first step. Uh, important to have security and uh, be able to track down in the during development. Then we have secure coding standards, six seven percent, security tooling. Also, it's an important resource to have and track vulnerabilities. Okay, yeah, interesting result that security testing, um, yeah, very high numbers. So the next we have security review, yeah, code inspection. Um, we can do also security review using the tool. So there is a kind of overlap in these two practices. And uh, yeah, we have penetration testing with 50, Five percent. Yeah, we, what we have seen many people discussing is that sometimes uh, penetration testing, which is a um, expensive resource, is used to get like uh, vulnerabilities that could be easily resolved um, doing um, uh, security review or using tools, for example. Then we have developed process improvement with fifty-two percent. Uh, which is uh, very good. And then document technical stack and thread modeling. Yeah, thread modeling, modeling I guess it's um, done in projects with more, um, a higher um, need of security. So in the last one, we have security training, 68%, data classification scheme, 43%. An operations guide, yeah, this this result is similar that we had. So operations guide is not 
uh, truly as important as the other practices. Okay, thank you everyone for the participation. I think we can go ahead and okay. So another result we got from the survey um, is we asked people to say how much of the total effort um, of the application um, is that you, so they selected one application um, to do the, to answer the questions in the survey. And we asked uh, in that application, how much effort was dedicated uh, to security. And then we did this chart by development type and we see that the numbers have a huge variation. So in new development, we have this average of 25% of effort dedicated to security. In enhancement, we had an average of 40% of the effort dedicated to security. Migration, uh, around 38%. Redevelopment, around 30, 20%, and also others. But we see that the, the, the maximum value and uh, some outliers and the range is very high of how much uh, each, pro each project um, div um, dedicates to security. And we asked people, uh, what were the challenges in estimating planning security practice? And we can see that this uh, is a very cultural thing. So, the first one said getting people to truly, truly stop and understand 100% why the best practices are, need, can, are needed can be a challenge when people get focused on delivery dates. Once you explain what could happen, it tends to sink in. The other one, uh, another one, convincing project manager to incorporate security related time and effort. Another Always people considered security as feature to add after business logic and programming are finished. So it happens to delay the project a lot. So uh, as we had many security experts in the sample, uh, we see that they have, they have a hard time trying to convince um, project manager or even developers that security is important. So, Having a tool that um, can help uh, define how much security is needed according to the risks of the project and char characteristics of the project is an important thing to have. And then let's do just one more poll regarding how your organization um, um, estimate the effort. So we have this option, so ad hoc, expert opinion, analogy based model parametric like Kokomo, other model of if it doesn't apply to your case. Okay, let's see. Okay. Leaving the poll open for a couple more seconds. Any last minute votes? Still going up. How is effort for software security estimated in your organization? Okay, looks like we can close and share the results. Thank you, Tracy. So we have 38% with expert opinion, 31% model or parametric, 13% analogy based and ad hoc. Yeah, that's an interesting result. In our survey with the uh, um, experts on LinkedIn, um, so expert opinion had a most um, the most frequent um, uh, technique used. Um, so that's interesting that we have here many people using model parametric, but we'll see next that uh, 
the current models we have, they're not, um, they don't have, or they, um, they have some uh, issues that we can improve on them. So yeah, that's an interesting um, result. Okay, thank you, Tracy. Okay, so going next, uh, we're going, um, oops, okay. So next, let's talk about a little bit about this uh, model models that we have for costing secure software development. So in this in that mapping that we do uh, that we did on the literature, we found um, we found actually ten uh, approaches to estimating costs of software security, but five of them were have a very uh, restrict scope. So these five uh, were the models that uh, could represent um, the whole software uh, development life cycle. So the first one in 2003, we have the Kokomuchu security extension. Um, so this extension was created uh, because of the need to also to evaluate the COTS uh, components that uh, started to be in, uh, introduced uh, in the projects and as they came from third parties, it was important to um, assess the security. So uh, it was this extension was created and we see that we have this um, these values here, additional cost are the, in this column, these values are the multipliers that we would uh, use um, to represent the increase in the cost due to security. Uh, and you can see the productivity range in this case was 1.85. 1 uh, the source of these numbers are expert, uh, is expert estimation and the model was not validated with um, real projects data. The second uh, proposed model was COSECMO in 2008. And we have um, a very large uh, producti productivity range because they used a um, two inputs provided by a commercial company and also expert estimation, but also we unfortunately couldn't validate um, this model. And then in 2014, um, a weapon system cost model was developed, uh, was proposed um, in the context of um, South Korea uh, defense and they found this um, only two levels, lower nominal and high, but this uh, range of 1.87. They use expert estimation and 73 data points and did a cross validation. Um, using this, uh, the security cost driver and also other cost drivers that they found for defense systems. And then in 2015, uh, we have this model, a secure operating system software cost model, also a Kokomochu based uh, model, um, but it, they uh, adapted to um, Chinese uh, security standards. And they found this productivity range of 3.75. Um, and this was found through expert estimation, and they did a case study of one secure open uh, operating system um, to validate uh, this proposed model. And we had some studies on function points, um, if bug function points, proposing a security extension, but you can see that this is uh, very limited. It increased only uh, zero to five percent in function point size of the project. Um, and it was based on a practice from a survey with developers and unfortunately not validated. So um, here we can see these same models. Uh, if we compare their numbers, we can see that, for example, for going uh, from nominal to high, it can be a 20 percent um, additional cost. It can be 80 percent. So we we have um, high variations and if if we go in the higher levels uh very high extra high super high these variations becomes um very very large 
in this chart with uh, excluded um, the COSECMO max, uh, which is um, uh, an outlier in this case. And we focus on low to super high levels. And we can see that going from nominal to high, for example, as I mentioned, can can be can be can be very different from one model to another. If you go to very high, for example, you can double the effort, or you can just add for add uh, forty percent. So um, this this can be done because uh, we have uh, expert opinions only, basically. We didn't uh, do any validation to um, to check to assess these models if um, these are realistic. So um, most of these models they use uh, the common criteria evaluation assurance levels to define these uh, these levels. Um, and they don't discuss in these models, in these papers, they don't discuss um, much um, this mapping and this rating from practitioners to select the appropriate level. And also, um, but, and, and, and this um, represents some problem because uh, many developers, uh, they don't use um, this uh, standard uh, this is a important standard, but it is mainly focused on product certification. It is used for security benchmark of ID products. The certification is expensive and take time. Uh, the levels are defined around the depth and rigor of uh, design tests and review of security features. So the standard it has a catalog of the security features and these levels are the levels we use to assess if these features are implemented or not and the rigor that we do this assessment. So it was not specifically developed for secure software development in general. Um, so this is an opportunity to develop a rating scale based on security practices because we saw that um, uh, nowadays, we have many options of security practices that uh, teams uh, do during um, software development process, and uh, some of these are not covered uh, in the common criteria standard. Also, we have these opportunities for validation of the, the model. So, uh, no model has been properly validated with industry data. And uh, there is now the COCOMO3 initiative to collect data from industry. So this is an opportunity to try to validate this uh, cost driver for security. Um, another opportunity is to use open source software repositories. So um, uh, we can see, and there are many studies showing that nowadays the uh, open source development, development has many similar characteristics with closed source uh, software development and having access to the code and to developers, uh, we have one more um, source that we can use to evaluate this, um, the additional cost of uh, security and the additional size of security, uh, for example. And also it's, it is important uh, to have the involvement of the communities of security experts and estimation experts. Sometimes this um, um, uh, Delphi um, sessions and these uh, opinions are collected only for estimation experts. It's important to involve these two um, communities. So next steps, what we are doing. So we are doing this uh, developing, developing a scale for um, measuring the level of application of security practices. So we, we got this uh, practices from uh, models used in the industry, like the touch points that I showed, the Microsoft um, uh, WASP model as well. And so all these practices, um, we analyze how we could aggregate uh, this um, practice that are being used in one scale and we are testing this scale to be used um, to measure the level of secure software development. 
And in parallel, we are modeling using the Kokomo modeling methodology to create a model that um, we can apply this scale and um, try to validate um, the security cost driver. So using uh, that model that I showed before, so we have these two sides, the functional and non-functional, uh, we want to uh, reflect uh, this both lines in, in the model. So we have this uh, CQ cost driver, which, you, which will reflect these levels of application of security practice as a multiplier. And on the other hand, on the size component of the model, uh, we want to consider the security features size. So, and we can do this um, in two ways, for example, we can um, estimate uh, the security feature size, or we can use a um, size factor, security size factor, to estimate um, the size, uh, the, the security size, um, and apply it to the total size of the application. So this is what our, we are uh, trying to do. And we are collecting data from security expert, estimation experts um, doing wideband Delphi. So we are currently doing a uh, online with security experts and trying to get their opinion and discuss um, together the, the rating scale that we are proposing. So we are getting this in, uh, their input and improving um, this is um, rating scale that we are proposing as well. Also, uh, we are getting um, um, data from industry, so projects data. It's a manual data collection form that we ask people to provide. And open on open source software, um, we are extracting data from the repository, so we can uh, some part of this data we can extract automatically using the APIs of the repositories. But we need to complement that data collection um, with inputs from the developers. So we're also um, doing a survey to collect this additional data. And then the, the next step is to evaluate. So evaluate the security rating scale. So how reliable is this rating scale? Um, the validity, uh, which is the ability to measure the latent variable uh, of security. Um, and then the effect of security on software development. So the significance of the coefficient for security, the goodness of fit of the model, and also the model accuracy. So yeah, that's it. I think um, uh, we are inviting everyone uh, to participate. So uh, if you're interested in participating in an Delphi study um, to analyze the rating scale and share your estimates, you can do that anonymously and see the results of um, other um, expert as well, so you you can compare and help us um, get this data. And also um, important to if you can provide data for us to validate these models, you can provide sanitized data, um, and and then after we do this analysis, we can provide you with the version of the model calibrated from your organization. So if you uh, if you can participate, if you can help us, you can contact me or also you can contact Brad Clark, which is the project coordinator of Kokomo Tree, uh, and he is managing of all data received from project. Okay, I think Tracy is sharing now the, the poll, right? So yeah, just I'll click and provide our information if you if you want to get involved. Exactly. So this is just another way. If you if you want to select one of these options, what we'll do is is we'll give your um, email contact uh, to Elaine and team um, for next steps on the the study and data collection. So we'll leave this open for a few moments. And.
and um, yeah, while people voting, I just uh, would like to comment that in the Cyber Resilience Summit, we are going to to present more about this rating scale and and these results we are getting from from experts. So if you are interested, you can um, go and watch the the presentation, which is will be basically a continuation of this uh, presentation. Excellent. Thanks. I'll close this. Oh, we just got another vote. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, and it looks okay. like about a quarter of the quarter of uh, attendees had marked something. So that's great. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, uh, all the yeah. help will be welcome. Will be very valuable data for us. And if you're ready, um, we're starting to get some questions um, for Q&A. Okay. All right, let me pop this open. Uh, is the CYBOC available for reference? Yes, the CYBOC is an open, um, it's an, op it's an open, um, reference you can i think in the slides we have the url i think it's available on the handouts right tracy people can download this presentation yes yes and if there was a link um so the handouts tab in, in go to webinar uh we've gone ahead and uploaded a copy of the slide from today um so there'd be a link to the sidebar there Yes. Um, Another question. Um, security features and implementation can be different uh, can be different depending upon the type of application. How does the proposed model deal with this? Yeah, so um, there are previous um, research shown that the domain um, can um, be an important variable uh, a driver in this model. So we're 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 planning to have at least these three domains: um, information systems domain, um, uh, engineering domain, and real real time system domain. So. Of course, it will depend on the data we get, but we are going to analyze um, this effort effort in in this at least in these three different domains. Great, thank you. Um, question in the questions box: What standards are referenced and used in developing the standard? Um. I'm not sure what uh, which standard are you referring to. Um, so, if you're talking about the CYBOC, so there are many different areas, and they refer to uh, many different standards because it's more of a, a knowledge um, areas. So, there are many different uh, standards depending on the area that it is. Uh, so, and there is a. a, a a diverse group of people involved involved in this initiative as well. Yes, and thank you. I think it was referring to the CYBOC. Um, the question was right underneath the first question about CYBOC. <laughs> and meanwhile, okay, now we have a whole pipeline of questions. Um, the security factors appear to be linear on the slides. Is this validated? Could they be exponential? Yes, uh, um, they are not. Yeah, they are. Uh, it's a multiplier, so uh, we expect to grow linear uh, with size. Um, so, um, but it's not the factor is not linear because we have a nominal high level. So in this levels, the factor um, grows exponentially. But the multiplier, uh, it's applied. It's a multiplier on the size. So in the model, we have the ex uh, the exponents on size, which um, 
uh, represent economies or diseconomies of scales. Uh, but yeah, depending of, on the on the model, the modeling step will will give this answer. So initially, we think that this will be a multiplier, but depending on the data, on how we model it, we can evaluate if it it can be an exponent on the uh, growth exponentially on size or not. And are you uh, are you looking at security impacts on either software maintenance or sustainment efforts? Um, we are so at this point we're initially looking on software um, and new development, um, but again it depends on the on the effort on the data we get. So maintenance can can be a, a little different uh, of new development. So initially we're focus on, focusing on new development. Okay, thank you. Um, on slide 29, you mentioned the security size factor. How is this factor defined? So um, in the, for defining this, um, security size factor we're doing some studies um uh, using open source uh we are uh classifying we are getting this project classifying the files in secure if they implement a security feature or not and according to the security level we're we're trying to find this proportion of um, security features on the code and also, we, we are going to um, try to collect this information from the industry uh, projects from industry as well. So then we will we 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 mm -hmm. have the intention to have this proportion in the security size factor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to invite Dr. Bill Curtis back, and if, if there's some more questions, feel free. I know Bill is just going to take a moment. <clears throat> from Sis, just to thank um, Dr. Beam and, and Elaine. Um, and there's a question here. Um, the common criteria offered in international standards for evaluated products, is there a drive for an international cybersecurity standard for software development? Um, and actually, Sis could, could speak to that as well. Um, Bill, are you back on? Yeah, I'm here. Yes, um, there are international standards. There's ISO standards for cybersecurity and for secure facilities, uh, and so I'd refer you to those. I think 27,001 uh, would be one related to uh, creating secure software and having a secure facility. Um, there is CISC has created a measure for measuring the security attributes of a piece of code uh, by looking at the common weaknesses, the severe common weaknesses that are in the code. We developed that from the uh, CWE SANS Institute Top 25 and the OWASP Top 10, plus other uh, common weaknesses that were considered severe. So that's a, a a good measure it would be you'd use static analysis to detect that and several of the vendors of static analysis technologies are now implementing uh, implementing that measure uh, frankly security from a code point of view security is the hardest one to evaluate uh, the, the vendors are finding it harder to implement the uh, the analysis capabilities to determine uh, whether you have security vulnerabilities because of data flow and another uh, other uh, very specific capabilities you have to have to analyze it. So, but that field is developing, and there are some very good, uh, very good uh, analysis tools out there, uh, and many of them are implementing the SIS standard for automated source code security measure. Uh, I want to thank uh, Elaine and Dr. Beam for their presentation today. Uh, 
Uh, I encourage you to uh, to look at some of the other uh, research outputs and reports and uh, that are being developed by the Center for Software and our Systems and Software Engineering at the University of Southern California. And uh, in addition, I would also encourage you to go to the CISC website. You can see it there. Now, you can join CISC for free. A membership is free because our work is uh, is funded by the sponsors, the sponsors you saw on the earlier slide. But we now have over 3,000 members. In fact, we're approaching 4,000. I think we're over 200 organizations uh, that these people come from. You can see a number of the organizations represented. So, you know, this is the Fortune uh, Fortune 1000 uh, type corporations, actually Fortune 200 in, in many cases. Uh, but we encourage you to, to go to CISC and the website. Uh, You'll be asked several questions, then Tracy will send you a password. Uh, in the website, we have all the standards, the uh, standards that CISC has produced through OMG uh, and, and the ones that are also going through uh, approval at ISO. Uh, in addition to blogs and uh, all the presentations from our various webinars and cybersecurity summits are there. So there's a number of resources that you can draw down. We're trying to make the this the website as a go-to a place for information about uh, the quality of IT and embedded systems uh, from both the code and the architectural system level. Uh, so I encourage you to go and, and join this community and, and participate. You can provide, uh, contribute blogs and, and other kinds of things. Uh, so again, I wanna thank Dr. Beam and Elaine Vinson uh, for today's webinar. It's very timely since this is a, a, an increasing concern both in government and in corporate uh, IT departments. Uh, so worrying about the cost and what it takes and where the right trade-off points are is becoming a, a critical decision point for a lot of people involved in system and software development. So thank you, and we look forward to seeing you again on future CIS webinars and our Cyber Resilience Summit, which will be on October 13th. Thank you and goodbye. Uh, one more thing from Barry. Uh, ah, Barry, yes. yes. Yeah, we're having our 35th annual Kokomo Forum on October 26th and 27th, uh, Monday and a Tuesday. And uh, uh, feel free to follow up with us, and uh, and we'll uh, keep you informed about uh, 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 if you want to submit something to the forum or you want to come or be uh, tuned in. Uh, coming is, is, again, going to be virtual. Excellent. Great, and if we can help you with that too, Dr. B, and this is Tracy from CISC. What we'll do is we'll send a note to everyone after this webinar. This is the link to the recording, the slides, the standards, and, and we can point out um, the, the Kokomo conference coming up. Um, so, great. <clears throat> okay, well, thanks everybody. Have a great rest of the day. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Hi, Thank everybody. You. Thanks, Elaine. That was really good.